when a bank gives a loan, right, um, the bank is taking somewhat of a risk. They are creating money out of nowhere, but that money needs to be accounted for at the end of the day. And, and then the person who is taking the loan, right, he's taking a risk as well because he's now got to pay that money back. But what is he doing with that money? Right. He's not partying it up. He's not buying a jet to go uh, in a to go fly out to Malta for the weekend. He's going to take that million dollars. It's going to do something of good and he's going to build something in the real world that creates value. Right. In DeFi, I see very little of that. Mostly what the client is doing with it is he's not building something of value, but rather he's using it to go and leverage it somewhere else and, and continue to, you know, to, to perpetuate this cycle. Do me a favor, picture your favorite crypto app or exchange. Got it? Now I have five questions for you. Question number one, does your favorite app or exchange have fiat on and off ramps that do not charge you crazy fees? Question number two, does your app actually help you time your investments with machine learning and algorithms? Question number three, does your app or favorite exchange connect to multiple exchanges to get you best rates, best liquidity, but also mitigate the risk of a central failure of one single order book? Question number four, is your favorite app or exchange Swiss made, but also licensed and regulated in the EU so that you can feel 100% reassured, but also sleep well at night? Question number five, is your favorite app or exchange fully aligned with your principles and values, 100% community centric and not VC backed? So if your answer to any of these questions is a no, what are you waiting for? Download the Swissborg Wealth app, join the new era of wealth management and enjoy the ride. Dear Crypto Community Blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonite, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest, Mati Greenspan, someone who's been on CNBC, Bloomberg, Cointelegraph, eToro, someone who's been calling the shots for trading, technical analysis, and tons of useful information is here with us today. Mati, how are you doing, buddy? Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I've been following you for a very long time, and I must say I'm looking forward to asking you tons of questions on the psychology of trading, what you've learned in the past, technical indicators, correlation, and all these fun things. And by the way, guys, Mati, you have a course as well, right? Like yeah, that's right. It's, a, it's available on our website. Um, the, course is, it, the course is in conjunction with Cointelligence. Um, these dudes, they're pretty awesome. They're awesome. Oh, this sounds like lots of gems are going to come in this interview. I'm really excited to hear more about that, Mati. But the first question I really want to ask you is, what the hell? Age of 13 and you're already doing paper trading. Is that true or is that a myth? At, yeah, 13 years old, I was basically, I would pick up because my grandfather, I guess the Wall Street Journal, and um, I was a few years earlier, there was a recurring thing in our school where we would, would sell uh, papers or magazine subscriptions door to door, right? And we would like, uh, it was a whole school initiative. And I remember the Wall Street Journal was always like way more expensive than everything else that we'd sell. Like a uh, subscription would be like hundreds of dollars, whereas the, the other ones were like 10, 20 bucks or whatever. And uh, so I would flip through at the Wall Street Journal, say, okay, this is the expensive magazine. Let's take a look and see. The only thing that I really understood at that point in my life was the price of of gold and I was able to track it and I would pick it up uh, occasionally and more and more as I got older and just see where, where the price is at. And then, you know, uh, with that silver and then uh, copper and other commodities, eventually crude oil. So yeah, for sure. 
And if you don't mind telling us, Mati, like you mentioned that, you know, you really want to focus not just on technicals, but also fundamentals. One thing that kind of scares me these days is some, some of the TA guys out there over rely on technical analysis. And right. I think when, you know, but when people do that, they usually miss, you know, some of the biggest bull runs because they're, they're waiting on technicals and they're not actually following the fundamentals. Do you mind educating people out there? If my grandma Susie was watching the show, what are fundamentals and why do they matter to you? <laughs> sure. There's two kinds of analysis that you can do on the markets, which is technical analysis and fundamental analysis, as you mentioned. Technical analysis is everything that has to do with the charts. Right. If you're looking at a chart, it's a it's a history uh, or a chart of the history of price. So we've got a few of them up here. And when you're looking at it, all you can really see is the history. But sometimes by looking at the past, we can kind of get hints about what's going to happen in the future. Oftentimes, you know, history repeats itself and so on and so forth. So if you see a kind of a graph that's continuously going up, then you've got a good indication, you know, that it's going to continue to go up. Um, though it could also go down. So you kind of always have to, um, but technical analysis is really good for not only identifying the trends, but also finding pivot points uh, within the graph. So for example, um, I don't know if you can see that is dotted green line, right? And that's Bitcoin, that's $10,000 on Bitcoin, right? And this is really understanding that, you know, every time that Bitcoin has interacted with this level in the past, it has been significant, either that it broke through that level or that it maintained it and turned around and went the other way. So that's all on technical analysis. Fundamental analysis is um, understanding what's happening in the news and how that affects markets. And that can be anything from monthly report about the U.S. jobs market, which has a very impact, a very big impact on the market every month. Or it could be just following social media, seeing what's happening and what kind of deals are being made or what kind of, you know, what the president of the United States or um, chancellor of, of, uh, of Germany has to say today and how that's affecting the markets. Um, or it could be stuff like, uh, you know, how many transactions happened on the Bitcoin blockchain the other day. Right. That's all falls under kind of uh, fundamental analysis. That's fascinating. And do you believe in these whole presidential events, you know, having creating like large fluctuations in the market? Are these possible scenarios? And does that make sense? Is that a part of fundamentals as well? Yeah, it, it's going to depend on what time frame you're trading on as well. I mean, everybody, every trader has their own kind of uh, time frame. So some people will trade for uh, an hour at a time or even a few minutes. And some people will take kind of a more long-term outlook and um, fundamentals don't usually impact prices in the short term uh, unless there's some kind of like really really uh, the last one that really got the mark obviously COVID-19 uh, had a very big impact but before that we'd see in January something like um, that general in Iraq that was assassinated um, you know yeah. that had a very big impact in the short term but on a day-to-day -day basis and especially the more long-term outlook you have, the more the fundamentals matter over the technicals. If you're thinking five years from now and 10 years from now, you really want to look at the landscape of the entire market and say, okay, this is uh, what I feel is going to happen over the next five or 10 years. And at that point, the graph isn't going to matter as much because you're really trying to peer in, way into the future rather than in the immediate past. That makes a lot of sense. A friend of mine in Japan who was trading on the Nikkei, right, used to tell me that early January traditionally had bull runs, you know, every year, just because Japanese people are on vacation, right? They're not working constantly and they have some money, they have some free time, they just throw it into the stock market. So I guess, that, is that also like another random event that could play factors on, on the market as well? Yeah, and sometimes you get that. And I mean, noticing those type of um, uh, time events that, that recur, I think that's really one of the, one of one of the great joys of being a trader, right? You, you figure out that every day at five o'clock and 15 yeah. minutes, this thing moves in a specific direction. And then it'll happen like one day, two days, three days. Or like you'll notice on every Tuesday and Thursday, we see this move. Um, those, I mean, those are really cool to find. Um, there, I wouldn't say that that's going to be like a main focus of, you know, yeah, of course. of being a trader or a market analyst. <laughs> but when they present themselves, <laughs> There's certainly a lot of fun. That's awesome. And Mati, you know a lot of people from the traditional world. And 
obviously crypto as an asset class is kind of seen as purely speculative. So people say that there are no fundamentals, it's just technicals, just people gambling. How do you usually respond to these things? Like when you hear this type of criticism or? Well, I guess they're right in, in some way. You're right. Um, all kind of trading of any market uh, when you're making, you know, kind of a prediction and speculating on that prediction, um, that's kind of a speculation play, right? And, uh, you know, crypto didn't invent this idea, um, but they are perpetuating it. I'd love to ask you, Mati, like related to correlation, you know, like uh, obviously, if you don't mind telling us out there and for the beginners watching, you know, what is correlation? Why does it matter? Of course, what are the pros and cons? But but also, you know, we've gone through some really weird phases, right? We've gone through people saying that Bitcoin was correlated to gold and then the Dow Jones Industrial Average and then recently the S&P 500. Are, are we just kind of trying to look at these things just to make sense out of it or does it really matter? That That is a good question. And I like the, the, the last, the tail end of the question, especially, right? Because we can analyze and look, you know, is it correlated? Is it not correlated? But why does that make a difference on our lives, right? Um, I suppose it depends really on on your strategy as an asset manager and as a portfolio manager. If you're trading only crypto, it, it really doesn't matter. Like all cryptos are going to be correlated, right? So Tron is is pumping today, but you know Dash will pump next week, and you know it, it you know they kind of take turns, but they're all in a kind of correlated market where when we are having a bull run. You know, and everybody knows it's a bull run. You know, you pick five or you know five top of your favorites, and you just ride them. But when you're building a long-term portfolio, and you're trying to think for the next five years or ten years or twenty years, right? And you're trying to say, okay, what kind of assets can I put in that portfolio? Um, then certainly there's going to be some of the crypto, but there's also going to be some stocks, and there's going to be some you know indexes. There's going to be some ETF funds and commodities, of course. And what you're really trying to do here is to make it kind of harmonious uh, in a way that if one market has a very sudden move to the left or to the right, it's not going to overtly re reflect on your portfolio, but rather your portfolio should be something that continues to grow no matter what the markets are doing. Mm. And in this sense, it does matter because people were saying for a very long time, uh, myself included, that one of the advantages of having Bitcoin in your portfolio is that it's uncorrelated. And that really gives a tool for an investment manager to kind of um, put something that is in his portfolio, which is not related to the stocks or the bonds or the commodities that he has in there. And it gives him an extra uh, piece to play with, um, which is quite unique in that fashion. And it's very useful. But um, when you say that it's more correlated, then that kind of takes away uh, that specialty to this asset. Now, obviously, there are many other um, very uh, important qualities of you know this asset class in general, other than just not being non-correlated. Um, but it does it does kind of contract from from that narrative, anyways. Um, However, even, the, I mean, we shouldn't go overboard. I mean, the, you know, we can really uh, talk this out. I think um, point metrics has the best kind of uh, correlation charts. Okay. Yeah. If I can share this with you. Yeah, I remember coin metrics. I haven't used that so in a long time. This is Bitcoin to the S&P 500. Can you, can you see that, right? Yeah, yeah, I can see it. So, um, when COVID-19 happened, basically everything sold off together, um, gold and uh, silver and, of course, uh, the stock market and Bitcoin all took it. But the correlation is only 0 0.6, the very, very top. So one correlation means they're perfectly with each other. Negative one correlation means they're perfectly opposite each other, right? And then uh, 0 0.6, it means they're correlated somewhat, right? Strong would be like 0 0.7 or 8. So 0 0.6 is not that big of, like, it's not really that big of a deal. Now it's spiking again, and then it's going down again. What we can say is that um, in the aftermath of COVID-19, Bitcoin has a higher tendency to correlate with the stock market. 
But that's just on a day-to-day -day correlation level. But if you think about what's happening behind the scenes and the fundamentals, and this is really technical data, if you think about the fundamentals that are driving both markets, it's generally uh, going to be attributed to the Federal Reserve and the central banks. They've been injecting cash into the system since 2009 in, you know, in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. And that's sent the stock markets through the moon. Um, but I believe that also um, a lot of that money that's been injected has ended up into the crypto market, of course, because it's part of, you know, crypto doesn't exist in a bubble, right? The pricing is of Bitcoin is still done in U.S. dollars for the most part in most places in the world. So, um, those type of, you know, the whole what's happening in the macro economy definitely has an effect, very large effect on uh, the, the world of uh, cryptocurrencies and digital assets. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that about positive correlation, negative correlation, 0 0.6 and the numbers on how to actually, that, that seems like a really cool source, by the way, Coinmetrics. This specific chart, I mean, they did it really well. And you can just like choose um, correlation between any two assets that you want that are listed here. And they've got a lot of different cryptos and, and, and traditional assets. So I like to play around with it and go, okay, the correlation between the dollar and Bitcoin or gold and, and uh, Litecoin or silver and Litecoin, stuff like that. So you mentioned, uh, Mati, like, you know, you talked about uh, QE and all these issues of money printing since 2009. And a lot of my friends tell me it's like someone who's really, really sick, has a lung disease, but you're putting a Band-Aid on the chest so it doesn't really help the economy Patient and just dead doctor. Why do you keep injecting him? <laughs> <laughs> That's so well put. That's so well put. And uh, mm -hmm. I was reading an article on coin telegraph earlier today, and it was talking about how the world's largest banks lost three X the, the market cap while Bitcoin actually gained in terms of its market cap since January. How bullish are you on Bitcoin on a scale from one to 10 at the moment? In the words of Pomp, along Bitcoin and short the bankers. And he's not short the stocks, honestly, because there are stocks that are are solid. But the banking system in general has been failing um, since the financial crisis. I mean, they took that money, but there really isn't any way to fix their problems. That was just a, you know, uh, a Band-Aid on a, on a severed arm. Um, and they've been bleeding out ever since, honestly. Yeah, yeah, that's very well put. And, and now and that it's, the fintech I'm glad revolution is coming. It's coming and it's going to destroy them completely. There's not going to be any remnants left of, of what we knew as the great financial institutions. I mean, they'll be they'll be there in the background, um, but nobody's going to hear of them. What is the biggest threat to you, like in terms of the crypto as an asset class? Is it Bitcoin itself or is it DeFi at the moment? Many people are saying uh, DeFi has been gaining trade, like crazy trading volume, right? The DEXs are going to the roof. You know, Uniswap has been completely moving. Binance is actually seeing less trading volume for some DeFi coins and tokens than some of these decentralized, you know, uh, exchanges and swap platforms. How, how, how do you feel about this overall? It's interesting. I like watching it. I would never trade on any of those things. I mean, they're, they're far too risky for my taste. Honestly, I, I you know, um, <laughs> the prospect of making a hundred times or, or losing everything in, in a single hour, is just, it's not my cup of tea. Um, because generally, I mean, be, the reason being is that um, casinos always make money. And even if the odds were zero, zero, even if the odds were flat, casinos favor to your, what ends up happening is that the gambler um, will will continue to play until he loses all of his money. So he might be up a hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars. It doesn't really matter because he'll just increase his bet size and eventually he'll get to zero. Um, so I view these projects largely as gambling and especially you're talking about a lot of, um, like I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, the amount of money that's being thrown at contracts that have not been audited at all. We've seen audited projects that are DeFi projects since the Dow, you know, in what was like 2014. <laughs> um, and it just, and, and it just keeps happening and people just keep throwing money at it. Like get something, you know, build something that makes sense and build something of value. And that's something that, you know, that'll look, you know, you can build something that'll create value and continue to create value that's something that I would be willing to invest in. 
But as far as I see, most of what's happening in DeFi, I mean, and yeah, the, the volume numbers do look impressive. I mean, we're, we're running up against the hard resistance of $10 billion, uh, according to DeFi Pulse here. Um, but the question but, that I have to you is, <laughs> of that $10 billion, or now $8.6 billion that's locked in contract, I mean, how much of it is, uh, is, double, is being double counted here? Right, mm. where uh, somebody's taking money from one uh, one contract, putting it into another, and then putting it back into the to the original one, five times, six times, seven times. They're leveraging themselves, and they're running a high risk risk of liquidation. But in the meantime, how is the money counted? Are you counting? I mean, this eight billion. I mean, is it maybe one billion that's <laughs> been leveraged eight times? I have no idea. Honestly, I couldn't. I couldn't pretend to go behind the scenes and uh, count. You know, count the count the dollar bills one by one that have gone into the market. But I think it also shows. I mean, because there is a lot of investment out there. We're talking about copious amounts of stimulus from those central banks and 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 from the governments as well. I mean, which you know. Um, arguably has a bigger impact because it goes directly into the pockets of people. And we've seen a huge wave of retail investors in the market lately. So, yeah. And I, I think that um, there is a lot of space for uh, investments and there is a lot of money and liquidity out there and a lot of it's finding its way into experimentation. And the, the good thing about this is that we're playing a giant game of capital allocation um you know the reason tesla's the reason that tesla has managed to go up this far this fast and come to ridiculous valuations is because people are making a statement and i believe that that statement is that i care what happens with my investment money and that's something that previous generations didn't really do they didn't really or maybe they weren't aware right that fossil fuels are ruining the planet right but it was one of the biggest investments is crude oil. And you invest money into, into not only the barrels, but into the oil exploration uh, companies that are, you know, that are destroying the universe. And then comes the millennial generation and go, wait a second, climate change. And wait a second, I'm not going to continue to, to, to propagate this, this problem where, you know, people are destroying our planet for personal profit. And that's where you get to the point where people go, okay, let me let me flip the switch over here. Let's flip the script up and and let's invest in things that are renewable energy. And unfortunately, um, going and finding a diversified portfolio in renewable energy uh, is not as easy as just you know downloading a Robinhood app and or Robinhood like app and and yoloing on Tesla. Mm -hmm. You go, yeah, Elon Musk, he knows what he's doing. He's going to explore space and. Um, you know, you've got this grand vision, but people don't realize what it is that they're paying for. Um, and then they, you know, and then, then we get into asset bubbles and things like that. It's so many gems there. Like, I just want to uh, summarize a few things because that was really good, Mati. I think first thing that I learned just now with you and thanks to you is despite the fact that all the data coming from decentralized exchanges or DeFi space is transparent, it is not necessarily honest. Because like you said, it could be some people just sending money to their own wallet, right? Creating this feeling of trading volume. I don't but think that they're doing it on purpose. It's not like, I don't think that it's deceitful, right? Um, maybe there could be some like wash trading going on. And like, honestly, I don't know how these guys get there. Get the, like coin market cap, I'm pretty, I could pretty much assure you that there's like, those, those numbers are inflated because they just take um, exchange uh, volumes at face value. Whatever the exchange tells them happened, they're counting it. Um, there are others, for example, Masari Crypto, they do excellent research and figure out what, you know, which of the volumes are real and which are not. And that's a bit more helpful as far as calculating ex exchange volumes. DeFi volumes, we, we don't really know what the what the real picture is, and it's such a mess. I mean, even you know, I, I know that it, it may be a sore spot for you know for advocates of Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, but people were talking about you know auditing the Ethereum network, right? I, now, obviously, that's just like it's it's such a silly 
um, request because you know, for you know, think about let's let let's go to Steven Mnuchin and say how many dollars are there in the system? I want to know where they all are. Fuck mm-hmm. off, man. Like yeah. really? <laughs> um, does it? But it doesn't really matter. The the value of one dollar is one dollar, and we know that that's going to stay uh, that way for the foreseeable future. Um, the price might go up or the price might go down, but. Uh, according and and the monetary supply may have some influence over that, but when determining the value, knowing the you know knowing a digit what the total supply is is not extremely relevant. I mean, we know what the rate of inflation is; it's thirteen thirteen and a half thousand new Ethereum's per day. Um, so we can kind of get a picture from there, uh, but. I don't think that there's anybody in the world that could come to you and say, okay, this is how much money is uh, locked in smart contracts and is um, original money that was put into the right. system rather than unleveraged money that was that's being reused five or 10 times. And that's really, really well put. No, I love it. And you know, even when I look at Dune Analytics, which talks, which shares all the data related to DEXs and DeFi, you know, there are not many users, actually. It's mainly whales, right? It's uh, a few people with really big, big bags, I guess, you know, using these type of platforms. But I'd love to ask you, Mati, you know, like, the, recently it really seems like there's some sort of battle or some sort of war happening on Twitter where people in the DeFi space are really angry at people in the CeFi space all of a sudden, you know, attacking CZ, attacking many people, you know, uh, t- saying that, you know, DeFi is going to take over your centralized exchanges, you guys are going to disappear. You're going to you're going to become irrelevant, and all these kind of type of comments. Is that how you see it eventually? Do you think DeFi can grow to a point where people will no longer need centralized exchanges or coexist? What is the future ahead of us? At the moment, what what's happening in, in DeFi? It's kind of a, a castle in the clouds. Um, there isn't a strong foundation, right? The traditional economy has a very strong foundation. Right. I mean, there may be they may have a lot of leverage and very high towers, but those towers are built firmly in the ground. Right. And so are all uh, everything else that's 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 around that's surrounding them. And um, when you know, when, when you try when when a bank gives a loan. Right. Um, the bank is taking somewhat of a risk. Um, they're taking a bit of a less risk depending on how easily they can turn it over and sell that loan to somebody else. But for the most part in traditional finance, the bank is taking a significant risk. They are creating money out of nowhere, but that money needs to be accounted for at the end of the day. If the client isn't able to pay them back, um, they need to, they need to shell out. Um, they need to, they need to pay for that. They need to pay the consequences. So of course, the law of large numbers, they've got enough loans out, they do their due diligence, most people are going to pay them back. So when, you know, when one defaults, okay, we can manage that crisis. Um, but in, in and, and then the person who is taking the loan, right, he's taking a risk as well, because he's now got to pay that money back. But what is he doing with that money? Right. He's not partying it up. He's not buying a usually, you know, a jet to go, uh, you know, to go fly out to Malta for the weekends or, you know, whatever it is. He's building something, whether it's a house or a company, a place of business, a restaurant. Right. He's going to he's going to take that million dollars. It's going to do something of good and he's going to build something in the real world that creates value. Right. In DeFi, I see very little of that. Okay, what I see is um, schemes, right? And what I see is like these companies that say, "Okay, we'll take your Bitcoin, we'll take one Bitcoin from you, and then we'll lend you back half of the value of that Bitcoin." Okay, I can understand using you know uh, collateral in order to make a loan. That's generally how loans work, right? Um, the bank would take some sort of a collateral. Um, but, uh, what the person then does with it, uh, is the, is the next step in, in the picture. And in this case, at this stage in time, mostly what the client is doing that with it is he's not building something of value, but rather he's using it to go and leverage it somewhere else and, and continue to, you know, to, to perpetuate this cycle. Um, 
So the person who's lending the money, first of all, he's never taking a risk at all because he's got that one Bitcoin of collateral, which will probably end up his anyways, right? Um, and then he, he gives that he gives out that half of Bitcoin. And then uh, the person on the other end, he's taking all the risk and uh, he's not creating anything of value. So what we have is, is, is kind of this castle in the clouds. Now, I'm not saying that that can't work. I mean, if we can somehow push it up and hold it up and build that kind of foundation in the clouds, I think that that would really be uh, something truly magical. But it's, it's very difficult to see how we get from, uh, from where we are today to a place where um, decentralized exchanges have completely displaced uh, centralized exchanges. I mean, the centralized exchanges, I believe, they will be quick enough to upgrade their systems um, in a way where we can use digital assets um, to represent or to completely replace at some point. A digital asset is an upgrade of a traditional asset, right? People don't hold stock certificates in their safe anymore. Um, they hold their stocks generally with their broker or these days with the app that they're trading on. Um, they don't need to ever withdraw a certificate. So the shares are digital anyways. However, when we're faced with a digital share that's being uh, counted in a database of a centralized exchange versus a decentralized digital asset, which we can verify its existence on the blockchain and don't need to rely on the auditing practices of the, of the firm that we're, that we're banking with, um, that is a significant upgrade. Never mind fractionalization and self-custody and all of those things. They are, those are also uh, advantages. Um, but my point is that eventually all of those traditional assets will make a move over to becoming natively digital. And we can already see it happening on the ground in the world of currencies, right, where we see this huge push from the Central Bank of China and the European Central Bank just recently made a call for, for, for uh, feedback on their own uh, uh, digital currency. The US dollar is also moving that way. We can see multiple hearings at Congress. And my firm, Quantum Economics, I mean, we talk about this stuff all day in the chat, but this is really like uh, an exciting one for us because there we can see the migration to the digital economy happening in real time in front of our eyes. And I think it's a beautiful thing. And Will all exchanges be decentralized? I think not, because people do want regulation of this at some point, and especially people, you know, um, who have uh, a lot of uh, money are going to want to keep it regulated. They have what to lose. Um, so there is there's a very strong financial incentive uh, to keep that level of oversight. And when you're talking to me about decentralized exchanges, I and mean, unless we can get a decentralized exchange which is completely regulated, which I, I may, maybe in 10 years from now, I don't know. Um, we'll see. It's interesting. It's an interesting one to, to think about. There's one question that you just reminded me that I absolutely wanted yeah, to ask yeah, yeah, you. Yeah. And you remember that's the whole thing about social sentiment, right? You know, how you right. were saying. I remember we had a call about maybe three to four weeks ago, and you told me something fascinating, Mati. You were saying, listen, everyone knows fundamentals, everyone knows technicals, but the future or one of the powerful futures in investment and trading or, or portfolio management is the social sentiment. Do you mind elaborating on that a little bit? I find that to be really, really interesting and love to see how you see things playing out in the future. We're reminded about that a little bit. Uh, today where we, where we saw uh, people actually comparing Binance Chain to Ethereum, which I thought was quite comical. And, you know, Binance Chain might have its, its awesome, very, very awesome properties. I don't know. I'm not a coder. I haven't, I haven't given them an audit. Um, but there really is no comparison. And the reason for this is because when you're looking at crypto-related projects, which are of a decentralized nature, we're not talking about companies anymore because companies are easy. I mean, we have it, the, 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 you know, market analysts have it down to a science, right? You know what the company's worth, you know what its book value is, you know what the other companies around it are worth, you know what their earnings are, you know how much you're getting for every single share, how many earnings you're getting per share. Uh, and then you can just say, okay, the, the, then the, the difference that market analysts discuss are, you know, um, what are the, what are they going to be their earnings in five years from now? And, 
should it be a bit more than should it be valued at a bit more than that or a bit less companies easy i mean bonds have their own entire methodology we're creating a new asset class here and this new asset class is going to have different ways of valuation those valuation metrics are very much under construction at the moment right um and i believe that because uh, because digital assets are generally networks, right? Bitcoin is a network. Everybody who uses Bitcoin is part of that network. Everybody who's mining is part of that network and all of the service providers from the exchanges to the wallets and everybody else are part of the network. So really, when we look at uh, the social media data, it doesn't tell us the full picture, but it gives us a very good description of quantification of what that network looks like. How big is the network? And we can start comparing, right? How big is a Bitcoin compared to Ethereum? And we can, we can look at that according to price per coin or market cap, but I don't think that those really tell the full details, right? Where we really want to know is how big is the network and how many people are actually talking about it on an ongoing basis across the different platforms and across the internet. And I believe that um, if we truly want to understand what the value of any cryptocurrency is, we need to factor in the, the network activity and the activity that's happening on social media uh, in connection with this network. That's fascinating. Yeah, it does tell a, a completely new story, right? Like you're saying, not just people who own it, but people who want to own it or are asking about it, right? And what the future could be for that specific asset. Fascinating. Exactly. In terms of technical analysis, you know, it's funny. I was looking at one of your debates on Coin Telegraph the other day, and there was this guy. Uh, he had this chart. It looked like my, you know, five-year-old who just scribbled on a piece of paper. It just didn't, sure. couldn't see anything. Just had one million point two lines everywhere. And uh, when I was talking to Scott last week on on the show, he was kind of saying that when he kicked off in trading, he was kept things really simple. Then he became extremely technical to the point where, you know, he's focused on the, the trees and not the forests. But now after, you know, 20, 30 years of trading, he went back to the simple approach. And I know that you always stress, you know, I like to keep things simple, although your charts do, do look kind of technical there in the back. But what is your overall approach uh, these days? How simple, how complicated is it? And also, what are some technical indicators that seem to be working with, for you specifically? Past performance does not indicate future results. Yeah. And that, I think, is the real key. Um, as far as technical indicators are concerned, I mean, it might look complex because I've got four charts up there. Um, but honestly, as far as technical indicators are concerned, there are exactly one on each of these charts, which is the blue line. This is the 200 uh, period moving average. And then what I've got here is I've got them rigged, which you can do on trading view over here. If you click the uh, interval button, uh, then you lock the interval, which means that if I change this to one day, then I can see all of the same assets that I was looking for on a one day time frame. So that way it's just easy to flip between time frames and I can see four charts that I want right now, Bitcoin, S&P 500, the stock market, gold and uh, the US dollar index. So uh, just looking at those four, I can get a, a rather good picture of what's happening in, in the market, it's kind of like an overview. But as far as technical indicators, it's just the 200 period moving average. I'll use a volume. I mean, if I'm getting really like, uh, I don't know, creative, I'll use like a Fibonacci retracement line. I mean, but that's really about it for me, right? Um, golden cross or death cross right if the short term moving average but it, like i'm trying not to put that much weight on those you know technical indicators rather um think about you know the long term which and, and like i said the longer your outlook the less any of these charts really matter then they really matter that makes a lot of sense it's funny because tom lee came on the show and he said the same thing 200 dma that's exactly the, the indicator that he likes the most but uh, i love to ask you about your favorite tips or do's and don'ts that you've learned across your career going through multiple asset classes uh, as and then obviously we'll put a link to your course for those who want to look at these things in more detail but 
for those watching out there, my grandma Susie, if she wanted to start investing or trading tomorrow, what would you tell her? Gosh. It could be psychology, it could be technicals, anything. Don't. Like <laughs> Just don't. <laughs> grandma Susie, please keep your money in your retirement fund. <laughs> don't trade grandma Susie. It, look, if she's if she likes going to the casino, and you know, just to teach her that it's a casino, right? It's That's casino. fine. You know, my my okay. I have uh, you know two grandmothers. One of them, they both love the casino. One of them plays the nickel slots, and the other one is you know at the high stakes table. So to each their own. But as long as you tell Grandma Susie that this is a casino, she can understand how to approach it. And then she can decide for herself from there how much does she want to deposit. And then she can she can start to fathom what leverage means, right? Um, for anybody who wants to keep their money, keep the leverage down. Do not go above 10. If you're going above 10, it means that you're going to lose your money. Almost definitely, right? Um, even and in the crypto world, 10 is even extremely excessive in my view, right? I know that there are plenty of cowboys out there and, you know, plenty of success stories, I'm sure, yeah, of people who never saw a retracement in the market. But um, for the most part, stay away from leverage in general, and especially if you want to keep your money. That's a great rule right there. I love it. You guys heard it from Mati Greenspan. And Mati, before we let you go, like, where should we follow you? Obviously on Twitter, you're very active. I've seen you post a few things on LinkedIn, but what is the best way to reach out to you and find out more about quantum economics? Quantumeconomics.io. Put your email right in that little box, click subscribe now, and you will get an email from me every single day telling you what's happening in the markets and what's happening with quantum economics. Awesome, Mati. You guys heard it, Mati Greenspan, the CEO of Quantum Economics, someone who taught us a lot about technical, fundamental analysis, correlation, non-correlated assets, DeFi, the risks, and tons of really exciting topics. So don't forget to like, comment if you have any questions below. We'll try to get back to you with an answer. And of course, subscribe and blast that bell notification so you can get access to this awesome content. Thank you so much, guys, for watching, and see you next week.